So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the surgical webinar series from SEEDS. And we meet each other every Monday night. And today we're going to be talking about uh, how to deal with the early problem after the thoracic surgery. And today we have uh, two prominent speakers. And right now we have Dr. Sintir with us. And Dr. Ines is having some problem about the connect connection. So. So I would like to start uh, the first topic first. The first topic is going to be about alley management in emphysematous lung. and going to be presented by Dr. Cynthia. And she is a uh, rising star surgeon from S Singapore. And she graduated with her medical degree in 2010. And she's completed her CT residency training in 2018. And right now she's currently work as an associate consultant at the National Heart Center in Singapore. And so Dr. Cynthia, please. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm Cynthia. Today, my topic is alic management in emphysematous lung. So alic remains a frequent and bothersome complication after pulmonary resection. Incidence is actually dependent on multiple factors. It can be physiological and anatomical characteristic of the patient at the time of surgery. And up to 30 to 50% of the patient may have air leak from the chest drain immediately after pulmonary resection. So the definition of persistent air leak, persistent or prolonged alveolar air leak defined by the STS database is an alveolar air leak that persists on the fifth post-op day. It is unlikely to resolve spontaneously within the time frame. And reports usually describe persistent or prolonged alveolar air leak as from post-operative day to 10. So several studies have attempted to identify the risk factor for persistent air leak after pulmonary resection. Uh, Review by Singh et al. actually summarized the different risk factor that has been found in the literature. It could reduce to reduced pulmonary function, which is very common in COPD patients with emphysematous lungs. Um, the concomitant use of corticosteroids when uh, upper lobectomy is being performed and the presence of pleural adhesion. Other risk factors that we can read from the literature includes surgeon-related technical factors, the extent and location of the resection, resultant size of residual pleural space, the view bleed, upper lobectomy versus lobectomy, bilobectomy versus segmentectomy or wedge resection. Patient-related tissue integrity can come from patients with underlying lung disease such as emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis if they have low FEV1, pleural adhesion, they are on corticosteroids or they are immunocompromised, HIV patient, the malnourished patient, transplant or patient that are on chemotherapy. So, ALIC after pulmonary resection is a common complication and can occur up to 26% of the case. Lung mechanics in COPD will change, causing increased airway resistance decreased pulmonary compliance, emphysematous parenchyma, this result in incomplete apposition of the pleura and the pulmonary surface, which is essential in closing alveolar air leak. Brunelli actually created two models to predict for uh, post-hop alveolar air leak. The first one, he actually incorporated predicted post-hop FEV1 and the presence or absence of upper lobectomy and pleural adhesion. But the regression model was very difficult to calculate and not all centers actually has pre-op FEV1. So the second model that he created was much more friendly. Um, they, he take into account the age that's more than 65, BMI that's less than 25.5, FEV1 less than 80% and when there is a presence or absence of pleural adhesion. So Lee et al. actually uh, devised and validated a simple scoring system to predict the probability of air leak after pulmonary resection. He had 580 patients over five years in a single institution and validated the scoring system in a consecutive set of 381 patients that was operated within the same institution in the next two years. So based on the scoring system, one is able to predict the possibility of air leak and consider surgical adjunct so as to prevent the air leak for emphysematous patient. So as you can see from the table over here, he will take into account the type of surgery, whether there's pleural adhesion, FEV1, it will be plus one for each 10% below 100%, and for the DLC, it will be plus one for 20% below 100%. And based on the score, he will come up with a risk on the left-hand side, and he validated it 
again later on and can show that actually this is replicable and this is a scoring system that we can consider if you are actually operating on high risk patient. So prevention of air leak is the best initial management. Prevention of air leak can come about by adherence to meticulous surgical technique, visuals dissection for lobectomy, especially for patients with incomplete fissure. You can use sealant glue, you can use staple line buttressing in patients with known risk factor, and you also can do that by minimizing the residual pleural space. So minimizing residual pleural space can be by pleural tenting or muscle flap, which I'm not going to touch on. I'm going to talk about what if after you have done everything that you could during the surgery and there is still an air leak subsequently. So this can also be considered for patients that um, COPD and they end up with secondary pneumothorax, you put in a chest tube. So there's still leak going on. And let's say at this point of time, they may not be a surgical candidate or the patient doesn't want surgery. What are the options that we have? So we can consider for non-surgical, you can have suction versus no suction, hemlick valve, Fluoro disease, you can consider if you are using a bedside fluoro disease. Of course, surgical fluoro disease is another option. There is thoracoscopy and fibrin sealant, pneumoperitoneum paralysis of diaphragm and endobronchial coil. So the last four, and I would include fluoro disease, would be considered surgical option for this group of patients. So suction versus no suction. The idea of suction is to actually increase apposition of the visceral and pleural fluid, parietal pleural, so that there is uh, short, shortening of the duration of the leak. So Mr. Sofolio actually wrote a paper regarding this. This is a prospective randomized study looking at air leak in 140 patients from 1997 to 1998 at the University of Alabama. They evaluated 140 consecutive patients that actually underwent elective pulmonary resection. So 140 patients from 1997 to 1998 a uh, patient will actually randomize pre-op to receive suction versus water seal to their chest tube on post-op day two. So their protocol according to the IRB is that for immediately after surgery, they'll put all the patient to negative 20 cm water suction. And on post-op day two, if they are the patient that are under suction, they will continue with suction. And the other group of patient will then go on to only receive water seal. ELIC were described and actually quantified by a classification system that was developed by the institution and they have a leak meter. So they have a fellow that will go around looking at the drain and as well as the attending and they will then decide how much is the leak. The group randomized to water seal state on water seal unless they actually develop a pneumothorax. So on post-op day two, they noted that 33 out of the 140 patients actually had an air leak. 18 was pre-op randomized to water seal and 15 to suction. Alec was noted to have resolved in 12 out of 18 of the patient by post-op day three, that means just being one day on water seal, as compared to one out of the 15 patients from the suction group. Subsequently, the 14 patient that's on the suction group was changed over to water seal and it was noted that majority of them had their leg seal the very next day of the six patients that actually did not have their leak resolved from the water seal group, it was noted that the leak meter, according to the leak meter, the leak was greater than four. They then put the remaining 14 yeah, patients, as I mentioned, to water seal and 13 of them actually stopped the next day. So out of the total of 32 patients, cost 14 plus the 18, in total 32 that they put to water seal. Seven had pneumothorax and they noted that these are patients when the leak is more than four. So this study concluded that chest tube on water seal seems superior as compared to suction for stopping water leak, uh, for stopping, sorry, air leak after primary resection. And if the expiratory leak meter says that it's more than four, uh, four or greater, they probably shouldn't be the patient that's on water seal. Water seal is not going to help this group of patients they are likely to end up with pneumothorax. So another paper by Mr. Marshall. So again, um, for this group, this study, similar to Mr. Sofolio's study, they wanted to see basically for patients who have undergone surgery, whether water seal is better or to put them on negative 20 cm water suction. So interestingly for this group of patients, what happened is that 
post extubation, they immediately put the chest tube to negative 20 cm water for expansion of the lung, and then they will disconnect it before they transfer the patient to recovery. So from recovery, they already have a group of patients that's under purely water seal versus patients who are under negative 20 cm water. So they have 34 in each group and there's propensity matching. 14 in each group actually had leak at the completion of surgery. They noted that the duration of air leak was shorter in the group in, with patients under water seal than suction group. So the duration for removal of chest tube was actually 3 plus minus 0.35 days for the patient with water seal as compared to 5.5 plus minus one day in the group with 20 cm water suction. So similar conclusion to Mr. Sofolio's study, water seal seems to be better for patients who have some amount of leak. The next thing we can consider is actually discharging the patient with hemlick valve. So uh, there are actually three studies that I have put together that compared patients with hemlick valve. Um, I just summarized them in the paper uh, in the table below. So Brunelli et al. actually did a re retrospect review from January 1995 to 2003. So they have 558 pulmonary resection, 32 had persistent air leak after surgery. They define persistent air leak as more than seven days and the duration tube with leak. They have air leak cessation in three weeks for 13 patients and four weeks for 12 patients, and subsequently two months for seven patients. Uh, in terms of complication, they had none related to hemlick. Mr. Sofolio's study is a retrospect review. He had 669 patients with pulmonary resection, 33 with persistent addict, and he defined it as more than four days. The addict cessation was noted post-op day seven for 17 patients, post-op day seven to 14 for seven patients and post-op day 14, nine of them still had air leak despite clamping and they just removed the tube the following day. So six pneumothorax was noted and subcut emphysema while the patient's on hemlick valve. They didn't really mention what happened to the nine patients that they had air leak and they removed the tube. So the next study that we had was Mr. Sofolio again. Um, he did a retrospect review from July 2000 to July 2007. So again, 6,038 patients were included in this study. The definition of persistent addict was more than four days. The duration of the tube, they actually follow up a median of 16.5 days from discharge with hemlick valve. So 144 tubes were removed if there's no pneumothorax on the chest x-ray. 14 patients have had pneumothorax on chest x-ray. So they admitted the patient, did clamping and removed all the tubes the next day. So for this group of patients, what we see is that none of them had any complication after the surgery, showing that actually if you keep the patient on hemlick valve for 14 days after discharge, it is worthwhile to see whether the problem actually resolved on its own. So the next airlink intervention we can try, if it still didn't work out with your hemlick valve, you can consider pleurodesis. And there are many methods that we can do pleurodesis. It can be by top pleurodesis, blood pleurodesis, pleomycin, doxycycline, or even mechanical. So again, I have a few papers, three of them, and I summarized them in the table below. So Liberman et al., he basically had a retrospect case control from 1997 to 2006. So he had 1,393 patients that underwent pulmonary resection, and he defined persistent addict as more than five days. So the intervention that they offered to the patient is observation, for 33 of them, 41 of them actually underwent pleurodesis, out of which 30 had talc, one had bleomycin, doxycycline had seven, and subsequently the remaining two had minocycline and hemlick valve. So they have successful sclerosis in 40 out of 41 patients, and the mean duration of air leak after the treatment was actually 2.8 days. In terms of complication, one patient was re-admitted for pneumothorax, one had myocutaneous flap for leak after talc, and one patient actually developed empyema after talc fluid disease. Shetkov had all actually had a prospective randomized study over 18 months. Again, 319 patients in lobectomy, post-op, 20 of them actually had air leak, and he defined persistent addict as more than five days. So this time, the method of fluid disease was actually using blood. 
In terms of reduction, you can see that for patient with intervention, it is 6.5 days versus 12 days. And the number of pleurodesis, using blood pleurodesis, it can repeat the pleurodesis. Seven of the patients required one, two patients required two repeated pleurodesis, and the last one actually required three. In terms of the control group, at post-op day 10, actually eight out of 10 patients were still having weak. So in terms of complication, one empyema requiring pleural catheter insertion and antibiotics subsequently. So the last paper that I have included with regards to pleurodesis, if I right. so it's a retrospect review uh, that was conducted in 2002 to January 2004. So 196 patients actually underwent lung resection. 13 of them have leak, and the definition of persistent addict in this group of patients is actually more than seven days. So 11 of them had pleurodesis with autologous blood, and two of them with hemlick valve. So all 11 actually have complete resolution, eight within 12 hours and three within 48 hours. The time to addict resolution with hemlick valve was actually not reported. After pleurodesis, there was no empyema, but one patient developed pneumonia and two fever. So again, based on these three papers, it sounds like if you have tried hemlick valve, 14 days it doesn't work, can consider pleurodesis. The majority of the complication, if any, would be empyema. So what if it still doesn't work? Or what if you want to consider something else besides just going ahead with pleurodesis? So some authors actually suggest pneumoperitoneum. So this is basically an X-ray of a lady who have undergone LVRS. Post-op, you can see pneumothorax on both sides. So for this, what the surgeon did is they actually put in a catheter at the peritoneum, and then they actually put in, instilled 2,500 mils of air and kept it for a period of time. Subsequently, released the air when there was no more leak and they could remove the chest tube. So I have a few papers and I'm going to summarize it in the table below again. So D. Yama Como actually had a retrospect review from 1998 to December 2000. So 14 patients with leak and pleural space problem after the resection. He didn't define in terms of what is persistent air leak. Uh, the air leak treatment intervention, they actually obliterate the pleural space in all after a mean of four days and the air leak stopped in a mean of eight days. So for this group of patients, they actually had no complication at all. The next paper showed that uh, they had a retrospect review from 1996 to 1997, 12 patients with leak and pleural space problem again. So they defined it as more than eight days. They put in a post hoc pneumoperitoneal of 1,200 to 1,300 mils. So there was immediate reduction in terms of air leak immediately after the procedure. And chest tube was, a, was able to be removed three to four days after the pneumoperitoneum. Again, no complication was actually reported. So interestingly, while I was looking at what are the ways that we can actually solve this problem, I came across an article in terms of what we can do for paralysis of the diaphragm. So this is a paper by Patella Miriam. So they actually describe in terms of there is a residual pleural space after lung resection and they had 10 patients, seven who have undergone lobectomy, two by lobectomy and one red resection. So they, the inclusion criteria include if the patient actually had more than 200 mils of leak at post-op day three, there is an empty pleural space on chest x-ray and there's absence of restrictive lung disease and known arrhythmia. So they went on to do a nerve block catheter for this group of patients. Um, by placing it under ultrasound guidance in proximity to the phrenic nerve between the sternoplanomastoid muscle and the anterior scalene muscle at the level of six cervical vertebral. And then they infused robivacaine continuously. They use fluoroscopy to confirm that there is reduction in terms of movement after this procedure. And then they monitor in terms of the vital signs and the respiratory physiotherapy were enhanced. The infusion was stopped if actually there was no more air leak and they will remove the chest strain subsequently. And at the same time, they remove the catheter that is actually causing the paralysis of the diaphragm. So interestingly, there is no peri and post procedure complication. And they notice an immediate reduction of the empty pleural space and the air leak within a few days after suspension of local anesthetic and there's complete restoration of the diaphragm movement that's been documented. So 
ultrasound. This is how they would insert the needle in the steno cladomaster and the anterior scaling. You can see they have some x-ray that shows that subsequently after the block, we were able to obliterate the space. So this looks like a very interesting method and there is no complication, but provided if you have someone or anesthetist that is able to do this procedure for you. Another option that we can consider is actually endobronchial valve. So again, I have summarized the usage of endobronchial valve for persistent air leak. Um, for Linga et al. actually did a prospective observational study from 2010 to 2012. He had 19 patients that has leaked on digital chest screen. 13, they actually when they did a scope, they identified the location for leak and they could treat it with valve. His definition of persistent air leak is more than seven days. 10 patients actually had decreased airflow, less than 100 mils. There are three that actually didn't respond. And the mean duration for, in terms of the tube was 7.6 days for patient that responded versus 14 for patient that didn't respond. A uh, subsequent paper by Ipsner et al. actually has a pa seven patients that underwent endobronchial valve placement. They didn't define what they see as persistent air leak. What they did was endobronchial valve and 100% of the patient actually have improvement. So in conclusion, ELIC is a big issue for patient with emphysematous lung due to the compromised tissue integrity and the usage of corticosteroid. Chest tube is the initial management for most patients with ELIC uh, and even for patients with spontaneous pneumothorax. So if it's the patient that have undergone surgery, of course, good surgical technique be combined together with buttressing stapler and sealant will be able to help. But if subsequently, if you still have ELIC, the next question is then to consider whether you want to put this patient on suction or underwater seal. Subsequently, if you still have this problem, the both valve consideration is hemlic valve. And if, it, if the patient cannot be on hemlic valve because the leak is quite significant, probably worthwhile to consider surgical intervention early. And the surgical intervention can be what I mentioned earlier on, be it pleural disease, thoracoscopy, and fibrin sealant, which I think the next speaker is going to touch on. You can consider pneumoperitoneum if this is a space problem, or even uh, if you have expertise in terms of temporary paralyzing the diaphragm. The other way is, of course, to do a bronchoscopy to see whether you can identify the leak and to put in an endobronchial valve. So that's all from me. Okay, thank you very much to Cynthia for a very extensive review. And for the question, I will be uh, referring at the end of the second topics together with Dr. Wan. So, beginning with the to the next topic about the preventing postoperative air leak patch or groove, and this topic is going to be present by uh, the next uh, prominent speaker, Dr. Wan Dupu Ines, and. He is a very well known surgeon from uh, Hong Kong. He graduated from uh, in 1994 and completed his uh, surgical training in 2002. And right now, he's work as a consultant and honorary clinical associate professor in cardiothoracic surgery at Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. So, Dr. Wan, please. Okay, thank you for your kind introduction. So I think um, always uh, prevention is better than cure. So we will try, always try our best to prevent air leak um, intraoperatively. So just to make some declaration, I bet it is just a kind of uh, uh, sharing of my own personal technique in dealing with intraoperative air leak uh, during surgery. I think, um, Previous speaker has already mentioned about air leak uh, in lung surgery. I think uh, we usually define that as alveolar or parenchymal pleural fistula. Okay, it is important to differentiate that from the real bronchial pleural fistula. So this is always associated with postoperative morbidity, prolonged hospital stay, with worsening of pain control, 
after surgery, and there will be increased risk of empyema and pneumonia in those post-op patients. And the incidence range from 20 to 33% after dilated pulmonary resection. So it is not that uncommon. So it is mainly caused by the visceral pleural injury secondary to anhesiolysis, or it can be secondary to trauma of the lung during manipulation of forceps. And always, we always find patients with field fissure, we need to dissect the fissures. And sometimes there will be some bowel trauma, which is secondary to the inflation of the lung um, by an anesthetic colleague. Many a time, these patients will have associated underlying COPD with emphysematous lung, and which will make the situation even worse. And many of our patients will have comorbidities like diabetes, steroid therapy, or previous chemo or radiotherapy, and that will increase the chance of air leak. Of course, um, there are preventive measures that will try to reduce air leak intraoperative. So we need to have meticulous dissections, especially during uh, when we are performing the anesthesiolysis, and um, we try to do extrapleural dissections, especially in very adherent um, uh, lung conditions to the paratopura to the chest wall. And during the dissection of fissures, we will use stapler or bipolar energy device. And of course, uh, I think this is most important: is gentle handling of lung parenchyma during manipulation. In thoracic surgery, we use topical agents mainly for bleeding and for early control, and that could be divided into four categories. Namely, adhesives, which includes the uh, liquid fibrin adhesives like the T cell of low cell, fibrin patch, sealants like the uh, uh, PEG based hemo patch that I will describe later on, some uh, fluid uh, base like the fibrin glue, mechanical hemostats like the surgery cells, and dressings. Um, hemo patch that I use uh, is a kind of a generation, second generation hemostatic patch. It has many two components. One is the bovine collagen, and the other component is the polyethylene glycol. Um, abbreviation is NHS PEG. So the hemostat and sealant control for bleeding and air leaking or fluid leaking. And the mechanism of actions include first is the rapid adherence of, um, of the patch to the applied tissues with the electrophilic cross-linking between the NHS PEG and also the collagen mediation of intrinsic hemostatic action with fibrin clot formation. So uh, I usually use the, um, uh, the hemo patch 45 times 90 mm. They came in uh, three different sizes. If we use hemo patch for air leak control, Usually there won't be any blood over the suture line or the raw area of the lung parenchymal surface. So we have to demoisten it with some sort of uh, sodium bicarbonate solution. Because the moisture and the alkaline medium provided by the bicarbonate, while it is in contact with the energy PEG, will form a hydrogel. And this gel will enhance the adherent and sealing properties of the patch. For any control, which is in contrast to uh, for hemostatic control, we don't need to cover the patch with uh, dry gauze that when you use, use it for hemostasis. The way that we do our uh, check up air leak is first of all, we will inflate the lung underwater of the pressure up to 20 centimeters water. First of all, we inspect the stump, make sure there's no leak from the stump, which is very important. Then we inspect the staple lines and also examine the lung parenchyma to see if there's any leak. For obvious parenchymal leak, we usually have to sutures, okay? In patients with very bad lung conditions like uh, with COPD, we use buttress sutures. On top of that, I will use a uh, hemo patch and glue. At that time, we will ask the anesthetist to get the lung inflated to 25 to 50%. For the, those raw areas, which is close to the uh, pulmonary vessels or the bronchial uh, stump, then we will use just the patch and the glue instead of putting switches. You will see what uh, I will do in the video later on. Mm. So this is the uh, patient with uh, left lower lobe lobectomy. This is the uh, left upper lobe remaining. This is the lingular segment. You can see that uh, there's a long parenchymal kind of uh, injury because uh, this patient has a field fissure. So we usually use switches, real pulling switches, to suture the parenchymal tear as being shown here. So uh, we use uh, endoscopic suturing and endoscopic lock tying technique. 
So it's the uh, effect is quite simple. So here you can see that this is the bronchial stump and also the vascular stump here. Over this area, uh, we cannot apply uh, structures. So um, for these areas, later on we will put in the patch and the glue. So after we suture up the parenchymal tear, so we will check it uh, with water. So you can see the inflation of the lung uh, and it is. We can see there's still some air bubbling, especially around the area of the bronchial stump and the vascular stump. And also you can see minor air leak from the suture holes. You can see it quite clearly. Okay. So these are the bubbling from the uh, needle holes. After we put in sutures, there's no point in putting in more sutures because there will be more needle holes being created. So once we identify it, then uh, they, we use a bicarbonate solution to moisten the surface and to provide an alkaline medium before we put in um, put the hippo patch onto the lump parenchyma. These are the surgeries that we use to pack the, uh, uh, the area of the lymph flow uh, sampling. So once we put the bicarbonate, bicarbonate onto the lump parenchyma, then we will use the forceps to apply uh, a patch. This way we use the, the, the whole 45 times 90 um, millimeters of the presence of these very long uh, suture lines. So the heel patch is quite easy to handle. Uh, yeah, even when we use doing it as a single port surgery, it still can be put in quite easily. And then we moisten it further with a uh, dental swab, uh, soak in the uh, soap with uh, uh, bicarbonate. Okay, so uh, to summarize, so what we have to prepare is, first of all, we need to have bicarbonate solution. solution. We need to dip the uh, dental swab into the bicarbonate solution, and then uh, we will trim the patch and then uh, we'll apply that onto the lung parenchyma. For that particular patients, uh, after we apply the uh, hebo patch, then we also apply some glue that I will show you uh, here. So we apply a second one. You can see that the hemo patch after moistening with the bicarbonate, it can kind of um, sit very kind of comfortably onto the lung surface. It moves into the shape of it. Um, so I this one, I apply a third one onto the area of the, uh, uh, the raw area of the bronchial stump and also the vascular stump. So it's quite easy to handle. So you can see that uh, after the most, uh, sometimes you use some blood to, to just kind of uh, put on the surface and that will enhance the adherence of the uh, patch onto the lung parenchyma. So after that, I will just uh, apply a thin layer of uh, T seal onto the uh, hemo patch. So you can see that uh, all the suture lines and the overall areas were being covered. So we try to get the lung right about 25 to 50% inflated, but sometimes it will be quite difficult for the anesthetic colleague. We will try our best to achieve that. So we get the lung re-expanded uh, re and then put the chest ring back in. For this particular patient, um, Immediately post up, there's no addict on the digital drain being shown here. Concerning the post operative management, um, we either use of 24 or 28 French chest drains. Um, we usually put the patients under water seal uh, or with a digital drain on suctions of negative 15 centimeter water. I, I understand that the different unit have different practice, but for our unit, we usually put the patient on suctions uh, for the uh, first 24 hours. Usually our patient will start mobilisa uh, mobilization on post-op day one. And for drain removal, we have to make sure that the alley has stopped for more than 24 hours and the output is less than 200 mils over 24 hours. 
I just want to share my own personal experience with uh, patients over the past few months uh, using this technique. A total of 51 patients underwent uh, elective major lung resections from February this year to July. Um, all of them have either primary lung cancer or a large metastatic lung tumor, and two patients received upfront chemotherapy. Concerning surgical access, majority of patients will have two port or single port uh, fats, uh, uh, lung resections. Five patients had fluorocotomy because they have large tumor more than five centimeters. Uh, we have performed 46 lobectomies, uh, by lobectomy, lobectomy together with semantectomy, total of three, and we have performed two semantectomies. During the same period of time, we got two patients with lumenectomy and two patients with reduced surgery were excluded. Uh, you can see we have quite a high incidence of field species. Uh, 33 of these 51 patients who have field species and 57 patients had uh, plural adhesions. And three of them have complete plural synthesis. And 31 of these patients need intraoperative intervention for air leak, like putting a stitch, putting a patch and tissue glue. The mean age of patients is uh, 40, 64.5 years of age, uh, ranging from 37 to 79. Three, uh, three patients have COPD go stage two, three on broker dilators. Uh, and the mean duration of post op air leak uh, in this group of patients is uh, using this technique is 1.7 days, which range from zero to 10 days. One patient had re on day four because uh, the air leak was quite huge even on that day and then even increased on day four. Uh, and uh, one patient had the blood pressure disease on day five. The 30 day mortality was zero. Two patients at the foundation had the prolonged air leak that required intervention. And um, one lead the respiration and one lead the blood pressure disease. The mean hospital stay postoperatively was 3.2 days, ranging from 2 to 12 days for the 31 patients who need uh, suturing, patch, and glue. And those without, uh, uh, the, without the need of uh, suturing, it's a bit shorter, it's 2.8 days. So you ask me, so is there any, any kind of uh, randomized trials available for the use of this sort of technique for any? Yes, it has just been done, but the result is still not yet available. The first one is this SEALS trial. It includes uh, 170 patients with uh, evaluation of any after surgery using hemopatrous and standard surgical techniques. And the other one is uh, comparing hemopatch to a tackle seal. So um, I think we are still waiting for the results of this uh, clinical trial to see the effectiveness. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in conclusion, I think the use of the patch and the glue as an agent of the conventional method of uh, parenchymal uh, lung suturing for any control of the lung reception is quite safe and effective. And we have still have to wait for the results of the last of those uh, randomized trial for de determining the efficacy of the use of the patch in the uh, intraoperative management of air leak after major lung resection. Thank you. Okay, thank you Dr. Wan for a very good uh, speak. So we move on for the question and answer. So is there anyone have a question just uh, uh, asked in uh, through the Q and A, and I'm gonna ask uh, one by one question. So while waiting for the question from the audience, uh, so I will begin with my question. Uh, Doctor one first. Yeah. Uh, about the you you said that you normally use hemopatch with tissue, right? With the uh, nowadays, right? yes, yes. So is there any selection that maybe you use only hemopatch? without glue or do you have to use both of a uh, hemopatch and glue in every case? Or is in there fact, any... I, yeah, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I first of the first thing that I use is sutures. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. Always, always sutures. Or sometimes I use staples to, to reset those very unhealthy, can't destroy lump around. Okay. Um, if, if over those areas, we can see, as I've seen in the video, we have air leak valve, the lead, uh, needle holes, and also the raw areas, I will use the patch usually. And I usually and use the patch together with the glue. <laughs> That's true. In a bit glue, right? Yeah. 
Is, is that possible that we can use only patch without glue or not? Or I, I think, he, uh, yes, yes. But I think I just have to, uh, I, I, think, I think that's my only personal preference. I don't think there's any scientific evidence behind that, but I think it's more secure. After we put the patch in, then we try to use the glue to, to uh, be more secure over the area of early. Okay, and another question is that, did you have any uh, use of a core seal instead of test seal? Uh, core seal, I usually may, may uh, use it for uh, bleeding. I seldom use it for early. From my own personal experience. Okay, thank you. Okay, so right now we have a question from the audience, beginning with the first one from Reynaldo or Cynthia. Is it safe to do the chemical prolysis in the case with a leak? I think the big question is how significant is the leak? Because the idea with prolysis is that for the prolysis to work, regardless of the method that you use. The, there must be lung opposition. So if the leak is very significant, and if you put in the material that you're going to pull this, but you still cannot get the lung to expand, you're not going to be able to achieve the result that you want. And let's say you are comparing between chemical and blood pleurodesis, I think it really depends on the duration that the tube has been in, because that's going to be a huge factor for infection and the patient that you're dealing with. So in my institution, I have used top pleurisis, I used mechanical pleurisis, and um, some of the other agents like streptomycin. I think so far, I have not experienced any empyema. But if there is any concern that this patient may have infection, then of course, um, doing any form of pleurisis will give you a high chance of predisposing the patient to empyema. In terms of success rate, if you cannot get the lung to oppose, then I don't think this pleurodesis is going to work very significantly. So, depending on the underlying problem. So, you said that if you, you don't see the lung opposition, so you don't use the pleurodesis, right? No, the lung is still it's the best. Yeah. Yes, correct. So, if on actually you see a very significant space, then I think this chemical pleurodesis is not going to help that space. It may help you to seal the leak somewhere else. So for example, if your leak is at the bottom, but because air is going to float to the top, so by sealing the bottom, you may get away with the leak at the bottom and eventually the top part is being resolved away. I think that's a possible way that you are going to get away with the situation. But if the leak is actually from the top and it's a space problem, then this is when diaphragm, your muscle, your fluid tenting, all the rest of the maneuvers is going to work. So Perhaps even before you get there, the problem is how are you going to reduce the space? If the leak is not very significant, then maybe one way is actually to consider whether water seal is an option or suction. I think ultimately there's no actual conclusion which is the best. It really depends on when you change to the other method, whether there's a pneumothorax. If there's no pneumothorax, maybe you just want to keep the patient on water seal rather than on a suction. For the other one, do you have any comment on the chemical prolysis after the operation? Yes, I think uh, for for institution, I think we usually uh, try to use protesis first before putting talc, because we all know the uh, the side effects of talc and uh, the long term kind of problems with talc. So we try to use blood patch first. So like our patients that I mentioned, that we got one, uh, two patients have a prolonged air leak. We use blood first. One is successful. I think the other one they need to go back in uh, to fix the air leak. So I think sometimes uh, as uh, as uh, Experienced surgeon, we know which patients edit is going to stop or not. So I think if you see patients who you should think the edit is not going to get better, it's getting worse, then it is better to go back into a to take a quick look. Of course, before that, you need to check the bronchoscopy to check the bronchial stump. And then if it is intact, then we'll go in uh, to see if there's any uh, uh, edit from other areas. Like our patients that uh, we went back in, in fact, there's a new parenchymal tear elsewhere, which is far away from a surgical site. So we have to fix it, the sutures, and then it just settle next, next day. I think it's, it's even the clinical judgment is more important, I think. Okay, thank you. And there's a question from Dr. Soon that how, how did you test uh, for air leak after hemo patch application? No, I don't, I, you can see after I put in the patch and the glue, I, I, I think after putting the glue, you, you shouldn't try to put pour in water <laughs> and test for air leak. Okay, yeah, you so you do just leave. You, do, yeah, you, you do that before you put the patch and, and glue it. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, for the next question, 
uh, from NIH Long Health Fund Center. What is the rate of the plural tenting in your practice to the managed alley? You do plural tenting to manage alley. No. What about Dr. Cynthia? Uh, I will say that do. in my experience so far, we've been quite lucky. We will usually be able to get away with hemorrhage valve and at most uh, okay. disease. So I still didn't have to go to the extent of plural tenting, but that may be because I don't have enough experience in terms of the number of patients accumulated. I think Dr. Wan may be able to enlighten the, in terms of this question. I think I seldom do plural tenting, honestly. I think I've done twice <laughs> in my practice. I mean, uh, do you've done plural tenting for like a prevention, like in, the, in some case of my, my case, if I do the, like a lung volume reduction, sometimes I do the plural tenting to, to like obliterate the space. Do you done like that or no? Like the case that you, you think that they're gonna be the problem and you do the, the lung plural tenting for prevention before, beforehand, before the, the leak is happened. Do you have experience like that? Or normally you don't do the tenting? For me, I, I seldom do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the next question, what is the role for WEPs in prolysis to manage uh, prolonged air leak after the operation? What is the role of uh, WEPs? Oh, I think maybe, yeah, yeah, Dr. Cynthia, please. <laughs> no, so personally, I think that um, WEPs will help you in identifying where is the leak. So it does help in, in the first place if it's a very significant leak in solving the leak. Secondly, with VETS, you can actually direct the chemical, I mean, if you're using chemical pyridesis, whatever agent, a little bit better than bedside pyridesis. Saying that, um, I've done bedside pyridesis when the patient actually choose that as an option and it will work. Yeah, so it really depends. But if it doesn't, the concern is, of course, um, you have a situation whereby some of the lung is stuck now, some of it isn't, and to go in again surgically is a bit more difficult. But if you are comparing between VETS and thoracotomy, I think it's always worthwhile to consider VETS first before going on to thoracotomy because sometimes you actually have better exposure and view through VETS rather than thoracotomy. I think for us, I think we, we routinely use VETS. I think that uh, it, even for patients with the, the three patients that I mentioned uh, had the complete prolosis, I think we, we are still using VETS for that. I think uh, to most people think VETS is in fact uh, provide a better view of the, uh, the especially uh, over the apex and also the front angle, it gives you a very good view uh, just to, to inspect for any, any pathology. But I think it is very important. Okay. okay thank you. So the next question is from Dr. Adrian. Has anyone uh, have an experience in using aqueous iodine as a chemical prolysis? Sorry, Dr. Have... <laughs> Cynthia, do you have any experience on that? I have not oh. tried using iodine. No, no, me too. I don't have any experience. For the next question from Dr. Padungkit, for Dr. Cynthia, uh, what is your opinion on from putting the small ball catheter into the residual space? I think for a patient post-op, if you see a pneumothorax, and let's say you know that the big tube that you have put in, because we typically put in size 28 French, is not draining because of the position, it's always worthwhile to consider putting in a second tube. If you put in a second tube, you can evacuate the air, obliterate the space problem, then it is worthwhile. Subsequently, I guess the question is, if there is ongoing leak, and then you want to consider bedside pyridesis instead of surgery, but like what Dr. Wan said, I would think that surgery actually gave you a higher chance of success. And in this group of patients, you really want to avoid having any additional complication and making, if you are even considered repeated surgery, more difficult. Uh, for the next question uh, from Reynaldo, do you have any maneuver intraoperatively after lung dissection or decortication to determine if you have uh, a significant air leak? Dr. Cynthia? Uh, so in my institution, I think routinely we do an air leak test. So we actually, after the surgery is completed, we will put in water, warm water, and we get the anesthetic to actually inflate the lung to a pressure of 25 to 30, depending on individual surgeon and we see whether there is any obvious leak. 
subsequently we can then put the patient on too long for a short period of time and they actually go on low flow to again look at the leak and depending on individual surgeon i think most of us will be able to accept a leak that is less than wanted or more that's the maximum because you are concerned about whether you can extubate the patient but most of the time to leave the ot i think most of the surgeon accept 50 mils or lesser as a quite a comfortable thing that we think that post-op probably won't have to do very significant maneuvers for the patient. What about the one? Yeah, I think it is um, always tricky because this is a kind of fine balance between air leak and the expansion of the lung. Because after decortication, I think we, we try to get the lung expanded, especially with a uh, very kind of freshy, kind of uh, horrible, woozy uh, chest wall. So we try to get the lung expanded, try to temper those bleeding. But on the other hand, while, while we get the patient on suction, then <laughs> we may not be able to get the patient extubated on table. So it's always a kind of judgment of individual patients. Sometimes I would try to stop the suction uh, before the patient gets extubated. And then after extubation, we would put the patient back on suction to get the lumbar expanded. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question for Dr. Cynthia. How do you tell the patient and family about to do the temporary paralysis with the diaphragm? like an informed consent because it's very crucial in some country Thank yeah you. so <laughs> unfortunately i mean i've never done this procedure before it happens to be a paper that i have read about i think there are studies whereby people actually if you do lvrs or you actually notice that you have a very significant um space problem some people actually do a permanent paralysis of the diaphragm by crushing the phrenic nerve but i thought this paper was quite interesting because you are able to do it just temporary and there is no complication so i would think that the most important thing is you have to have the expertise to do this you have to have some numbers and be accredited to do this and from there you are able to explain to the patient what's going to happen of course the complication that can arise for this is it can be permanent and there can be arrhythmia so you will need very close monitoring for this procedure yeah more of something that i read about that i thought it's quite interesting to share but i haven't done it personally thank you and for the other one yeah i think we really try to paralyze the uh diaphragm uh, chemi uh, chemically or mechanically. I think it is important because we are now seeing lots of patients of uh, very borderline lung function. If you, I think if they lose the diaphragmatic function, then there will be quite a risk for them. And I think by comparing the risk of patients of uh, losing the diaphragmatic function and the small space, I, I would rather leave a patient with a small space because with time that may improve. And um, there's an, another question from Dr. Edmund. Do you have an experience in using one bay endobronchial valve for persistent airway in the patient who are high risk for surgery? Beginning with uh, Dr. Wang. Oh, Dr. Cynthia. Sorry. Um, in my institution, I think we have patients who are COPD, have very emphysematous lung and secondary pneumothorax. Uh, surgical risk is very, very high. Um, most of the time, the interventional respiratory physician may try to put in a scope and they can try endobronchial valve. But the results really varies and it depends on, I guess, where is the leak and how many locations of the leak and the interventionist expertise in doing this. So personally, I have no experience in this. I think Dr. Wan may be able to enlighten us in terms of this. Yeah, I think we, we did use uh, and the bronchial valve uh, in the past for patients with COPD and also patients with air leak. I think unfortunately, this, most of these patients, uh, they have lots of collateral uh, channels. So even though we block off one lobe, there will be some collaterals uh, from the other. So uh, usually uh, we try to, to see whether there is any uh, sort of complete fissures or using some charters technique to see for any collateral uh, ventilation before we put it in the bronchial valve. Thank you. So right now we uh, finish the, all the questions. So I think we have about time. Right now it's almost uh, 8 p.m. So I would like to thank uh, to end the session and I would like to thank all the participants. I hope you get um, enough knowledge and how to manage with the air leak. And also I want to thank uh, all the speakers for the very excellent uh, uh, speak. And okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, 
thank you for joining us uh, for the C webinar series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.